I decided that I cannot go further with the review process for the MICA EPA1 uh, until I talk a little bit more about reviews and uh, what we think in general about what reviewing of the gear means, what is the current reviewing practice and what are the big uh, issues with it and how we can get around it. And uh, Giorgio brought into my attention uh, Peter Quattrup's article. Uh, those who don't know Peter Quattrup, he's the he's basically he is Audionaut, or he is the mastermind behind Audionaut. And uh, if you don't know, then he has a lot of writings about audio, lots of interesting things. And uh, here I put down the link for his uh, website and the article in question now is Are you on the road to audio hell? And uh, I'm going to follow that uh, train of thought that, that he is doing in his article and also add my thoughts about it and just give a couple pointers <laughs> from my experience. So, so Peter starts by uh, talking about how is the performance of audio equipment uh, judged and that the uh, judging process has drastically changed over the course of the years when we go back to the 60s in that time uh, it was all about measurements so so basically in the 40s uh, the Williamson circuitry came out so that was a push-pull circuit with a uh, negative feedback, lo uh, global negative feedback and uh, and when uh, Williamson he uh, measured it he could find that it has a very good very low uh, total harmonic distortion and a pretty good uh, frequency extension that can be achieved with, with that circuitry and from then on uh, when people made uh, built new amplifiers, they, they measured them and they published these figures and that became standard practice. And uh, of course, people had the idea, if we know about this, then a better measurement means a more perfect uh, technology. So basically, our equipment is demonstrated to perform better. So in the 60s, that was uh, uh, the way how to establish which amplifier is better. Measure it, measure is the best, it's the best, period. But by the 70s, people have realized that uh, there's, there's a glitch with this system. And, and they, they already were scratching their heads because the amps and, and speakers and equipment that measured the best often didn't sound the best. Of course, there were some correlations, so if, if it measures really poorly, it will not sound good. But a good measurement or an excellent measurement by itself is not enough for good sound. And, and they, they could take two completely different amplifiers that measured exactly the same, and one sounded superb and the other was below mediocre. So, so they realized that there's something wrong about that. So that's when listening evaluation started. And at that time, uh, underground magazines were the proponents of these uh, listening comparisons. So the so-called golden ears sat down or they were called later on as golden ears because people thought that they can hear more than an average person because they do, it, do that all the time, they have practice in it. And yes, that's true. If you practice something, you will become better at it. And, and also, that's, that's the secret to good hearing and to be able to tell the differences between uh, uh, sonic attributes of audio gear. You have to practice it, and then you will get better at it. Uh, you, you will learn with time what to listen to, what to hear, and then you can go on more, more, more and more. So basically, people started giving reviews, and at that time, 
these were just underground magazines. They were on the fringe. But by the 80s, 90s, these underground fringe magazines became the big ones. Uh, they became the main voice that defined, uh, defined audio and defined like who is who in audio. So if that magazine said that that's the best, then people thought that's the best and bought that product. However, by the 80s, there were so many products coming up and there were so many different reviewers, each of them different priorities, saying different things, that uh, the companies realized that uh, they, they need a little bit of extra to push their products. So from the 80s, we saw that marketing was catching up. So the companies started placing ads in the magazines and uh, and that created an aura of holiness so so if there was like a full page ad uh, showing uh, a really nice amplifier in a really taken by a professional photographer and there's like really nice slogans uh, around it showing people enjoying the sound uh, then uh, people were inclined to think that yeah probably that's that's the best sounding equipment because you know it appears in the magazines and it's been reviewed in the magazine so that's phenomenal and that's how the marketing started to seep into the stereo review and uh, qualification performance judgment process and uh, let's jump a little bit to our day uh, and, and I skip here one stage that Peter doesn't mention, but I will, is that today the review is basically done by uh, comparing uh, the systems on reference recordings. So today we think that, okay, I know what the mic feed is because I was there when something was recorded and I heard the monitoring equipment, so I know how it's supposed to sound. And, and now let's play it on a system and if it can give me the same experience as I heard in that uh, recording monitoring system, then that's the best system. Of course, as you see, <laughs> there are issues with that, uh, but, and we'll go into that as well and see what's wrong about it. So why did I choose Hieronymus Bosch's uh, picture <laughs> for the review process? Because you see, these two nice fellows here, they are our reviewers and they, they are, one of them he's fast in, dressed in a really fancy uh, outfit and, and he has a very sour face and uh, he, he deals out uh, judgment and punishment and uh, and as you see the the other reviewer is also <laughs> very serious and the ears are covered by by something you know it looks like uh, whatever around uh, the ears so it kind of like yeah you know, i'm not really listening for the sound but you know they pay me to do the review so why not uh this is actually this, this was something really cynical to say but uh, that's actually part of the harsh reality that the reviewer's hands are bound together. Uh, because if, if there is a big customer who is paying big money for the magazine, they, they cannot say something bad about that product. Because they would lose that supporter of the magazine. And uh, so, so when you read reviews, you have to know that look up the magazine and see if that company advertises a lot or not. If you do not see any ads from that company in that uh, magazine and, and they some, say something nice about it or really nice, then that's, that's a really big indication for you that something really special is going on. And if they trash something really badly, then look it up. If there are no <laughs> advertisements for that product, there's a good chance that it got a bad review too. As an incentive for the company, okay, you know what? Please advertise and then a couple of months later, we'll review another product of yours and then you get a growing review or something much better. And then it's good for the company because they get a good review 
and it's good for the magazine because they can survive because if they do not get the support of the companies who pay for the ads then the magazines uh, would be no more and uh, let's be honest to each other this is a two-sided coin because yes the system is rigged to a certain point but also if 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 it wouldn't happen there would be no magazines there would be no stereophile wouldn't have been absolute sound and most of us who who are listening now <laughs> uh, to you know youtube stuff about audio we wouldn't be doing that because we would have no idea that there is such a world as audio so so i really thank the magazines and reviewers and the companies who are willing to pay for the ads to that they have created a venue for us so this is like breadcrumbs so we can follow the breadcrumbs and and find the treasure but then it's up to our own intelligence whether i follow the breadcrumbs to the witch's hut <laughs> or uh, following the breadcrumbs i oh you know i just realized okay i'm in the forest let's now wake up become an adult audiophile not a baby audiophile who goes for the next shiny toy so <laughs> what are uh, the issues with the review process uh, and uh, for this i chose uh, Hieronymus Bosch's uh, final judgment <laughs> as the background and and I chose that because this is how companies feel when they are being judged so when you when you read a review and they say that oh this speaker is really promising because this and the technology but we measured it and and there was a resonance at 440 hertz uh, there was a, a, a 58 millisecond uh, ringing which is uh, acceptable but we we expected more and and we tried to run it with a, a high sensitivity whatnot and and it did not didn't work blah 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 so when when you read that for you it's it's a bit of interesting information but for the person who designed that amplifier or speakers or whatnot for them it feels like they are burning in hell it's, it's like a torture and man, many designers or engineers are tearing their hair out like how could they say things about like that about my baby so the thing with the review process is that it is not consistent so each reviewer has his or her unfortunately mostly his <laughs> that there's not too many female reviewers so 99 percent male so mostly his opinion and uh, his method on how he evaluates a product and and this pro process is not truly consistent and peter warns us about this fact that uh, how far conclusions can we draw about the review because the problem is that uh, review is typically like they get a component like review of a speaker and they place it in a system and then they they compare it against another product which is already in the system and and then you know reviewers they already have their favorite system and and if you go on youtube you you look up the stereophile reviewers each each of them basically shows on on, on youtube channels their their systems how it looks like what what are their preferences uh when they review gear what is the, the system that they review it on and and that's the big problem because uh when you put a component into the system you are not judging that component you are judging on what that component does to that system what is the interaction between the two and and sometimes uh, what can happen is if you put in a higher quality component then it will show the weakness of the system and and the review will be partially about what that component brings to the table but part of the sound of the result will be the reviewer's system so either the reviewer system's weaknesses 
get revealed by the new component or the strength of the system will be amplified by the component and um, and that's why uh, I think Peter does not uh, tell much more about that but this this is what I'm telling you guys now is that if you want to review something properly then you have to review it within a system that is compatible with it so 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 to say that in a system that speaks the same language as that component speaks so for example if you want to review an audio note speaker then review it with an audio note system if you want to review a conrad johnson cd player review it in a conrad johnson system and uh, and if when you use components cabling then make sure to use cabling that the uh, manufacturer recommends that which the, the manufacturer tells that 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 type of cable will be compatible with my product and luckily actually i'm seeing this a lot that if the manufacturer specifies okay i want you to use kimber cable or wandenhul cable or mit Maybe one day hole I do not see too much in the US, we do not have one day hole, uh, but often MIT is mentioned in a lot of cases, and then the reviewers will go on and, and, and hook it up with MIT cable. So that, that's something nice. So there's, there's a little bit of warming up going on there. And also when I look at online review channels, there's like more and more people like, like Steve Gutenberg, the audiophiliac, he he always mentions that when he reviews something then he also tried out this and that uh, as a comparison and then he tried to use like different amplifiers with it and and he tells you what kind like broader uh, discussions and implications and uh, and that also hints at his really vast experience in the audio field um, and uh, but still he would not say bad negative things about products uh, but actually i agree with him because another thing with the review is that us we have to learn how to read reviews and how to watch reviews because uh, for example for steve that's his livelihood to review products and and he knows because he had a huge sales experience that if you mention 10 glowing facts about something and one weakness one bad thing what will people remember only the one bad thing so you can have maybe the world's second best speaker and and you can rant about it for an hour and mention something uh, when i placed it in the corner it sounded bad and then Oh, the only fact that that 99% of people will remember it is that when you place it in a corner it sounds bad and no one will be interested in it so that's a thing so this is the other uh, part <laughs> of, uh, of the review process another Hieronymus Bosch painting that I call it the supporter of the magazine award so so when you uh, advertise a lot in a magazine then you really get glowing reviews so please everyone open eyes and when you read uh, reviews those products who you speak who you see uh, lots of ads in the magazine they have this eden type of uh, glowing <laughs> situation and for them it's a piece of cake to to have a new product um, received by a really really warm welcome and uh, sometimes uh, problems can arise of it but they, they just go um, kind of unnoticed so some people are really annoyed by this fact that there are some companies who who can uh, <laughs> get away with anything uh, because they, they support the magazine so much uh, but that's as King Crimson says, that is a fact of life. It's just, uh, that's it. And now what Peter is saying, another thing is that we have now this comparison by reference recordings. 
So, so you pick a few recordings and you say that, oh, I know this recording by heart, I know how it should sound, and if the system can recreate that, then uh, that's the better system. But as Peter says, there's a big problem with this because you have no idea how that recording should sound. Even if you were there at the recording process, you have zero clue what went on to the tape or into the beat stream. Because what you heard was, uh, was a monitoring system which is flawed. There, there are no uh, perfect recording systems. In fact, most of the monitoring systems in recording studios are really uh, medium quality and they are there to give us a reference of how it would sound at an average uh, consumer's equipment, which is not even high-end. And then they, they adjust all, all the mixing panels, all the parameters for the recording to make sure it sounds good in a semi-junky system. There are, of course, some stu recording studios which have higher quality recording e and monitoring equipment, but even there you do not know what the the mic feed sounds. <laughs> you only know what the uh, headphone preamp or, or the output preamp sounds that was used at, with, in, with the recording process. And as Peter was saying that the start of the digital era did uh, pretty bad for this process because with digital every recording has the same sonic signature. If you have never been exposed to high quality uh, sources other than digital, then you do not grasp what this is. And I didn't understood this either when uh, I am till the point that I only had high quality digital. When I had high quality analog, then I understood what this is really about. And, and now, if I hear digital, it, they have the same sonic signature. It's like if you walk to an art gallery and, and you see these modern paintings, modern art objects, all of them are different, yes. So all of the CD recordings do sound different, but they are the same style. So it is the same, it's like in this gallery, everything is same style. And if you have a high quality vinyl, this is the range you get. There is no... A sonic signature that stays with every recording so each each record you put on your turntable has its own sonic signature and they can be drastically different from each other like listening to different formats so so with cd you you have a conformity everything kind of sounds the same and within that narrow range it can sound better or it can sound weaker, but you still hear that it's the C you you can hear the characteristics of the CD player, the sonic signature, which is like really really strong. And and when you go to high quality vinyl, then uh, you can get all sorts of signatures. Like for example, we have here this uh, ancient Egyptian wall painting that's kind of like a. Uh, a 78 rpm uh, record like looks like uh, the wall is chipped and and there, there's not too many colors in it like mono recording uh, that's that's like the old recording sound but it has its own separate character it has its own magic its own specialty which makes it different from anything else then that that type of thing you do not get from a cd or, or you can you can get like a, a, a Monet type of sound, which is like an impressionist sound, or or a more modern sounds like 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 a Dali, and then it takes you to some surreal places in your imagination, or or something really descriptive and and lots of things, emotions happening, which truly grab you and, and draw you into into a different universe or also you can reach that uh, world that that the digital offers so for example with my analog setup if i play a, a digitally recorded uh, lp it sounds exactly 
as if I was playing a CD. You cannot tell it's not a digital playing. And you get the same <laughs> signature there as if you are listening to a, a digital source.